This conference will now be recorded. Good morning. I'd like to call to order the Harvest Board of Selectments meeting for March 13th, 2021. And I'll begin by roll call. Uh, Michael? I'm here. Ed? Here. And I'm here. And as I said, uh, so we have a quorum. Uh, Don will join us shortly. Uh, John, I'll turn it to you. Do you want to uh, call to order the Finance Committee? Uh, thank you, Larry. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, John Shorey, Chair of the uh, Harwich Finance Committee. I'd like to call uh, this meeting to, to order uh, by roll call vote. Uh, Mary Anderson? Here. Uh, Dale Kennedy? Here. Angelo? Here. Dan? Here. Mark and myself. Uh, we have um, right, six, uh, six members present, Larry. Thank you very much. Thank you. We shall, uh, this, uh, we're continuing our uh, discussion of the uh, uh, budget items for this uh, this uh, this year. And first on the agenda is golf. Uh, Joe, do you have any introductory comments or should we just start with golf? Well, if I may, Mr. Chairman, first, uh, good morning to you, to the members of the Board of Selectmen, and good morning, Chairman Chory, the members of the Finance Committee. Uh, this our third of uh, four budget hearings. Uh, starting us off would be the uh, the golf department, uh, which is uh, I think appropriate timing. This being the second uh, day that they're fully operational, um, with limitations on carts, of course, but operational for the golf season. So our 2021 golf season is underway, and with that, I turn it over to our golf director, Roman Greer. Thank you, Joe. Good morning, uh, Mr. Chairman. My name is Roman Greer. I'm the director of golf for the town of Harwich. I'm joined by Clem Smith, our uh, golf chairman, and Sean Fernandez, our golf course superintendent. I trust that everyone received the materials I submitted, just a, a brief narrative of our FY22 budget request. Uh, I, I won't go through the whole thing, but I obviously <laughs> don't know if anybody has any. Uh, in general, the golf course, golf in general, is seeing a, a, an unprecedented surge due to, the, due to the pandemic. We're seeing that at Cranberry Valley as well. We're seeing uh, participation levels at the highest we've seen among annual pass holders and among the general fee-paying public. Um, we, we, we took the uh, guidance of the town administrator and returned a level-funded budget. We're actually slightly under. Um, under last year's budget at the FY21 budget and uh, any increases were just strictly due to contractual obligations on the salary and wage side. Uh, no new employee hours were added or positions and uh, we made appropriate cuts in, in the uh, expense side to balance it out. Um, at this point our revenues are really strong as, as I mentioned in my narrative we're outperforming FY19 which was our all-time high watermark in revenue and uh, the last normal year we've had for, with, with no uh, tornado or pandemic. So revenues look really strong. I think the $1.8 million anticipated revenue for FY22 is appropriately conservative, but um, you know, based on the, the new environment we're in where we can face uh, state uh, imposed sanctions or say state imposed limitations at any point in time, and, uh, and tornadoes and events like that can happen. It, it, it's, it's an appropriately conservative number, but um, <clears throat> on the path we're currently on, I see us exceeding it without a problem. And um, I also listed the increases to our rates and fees that were approved by the selectmen in the fall. Um, that, that's all I have for you. I, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Roman. Let me, uh, let me call members of the uh, select board, select, uh, select committee, uh, Ed. Oh, I'm, I'm Michael. Uh, no questions at all. Just a, uh, I'll say what I said when they gave us their report. Uh, great job, Roman. Uh, great job, Sean, and and to all the uh, staff and and committee members. The uh, the original numbers looked horrible last year, uh, or at least the projected numbers, and you guys really pulled this off. So. Can't, can't say enough about the operation, and I know there was some frustration, but uh, I know you guys are working towards fixing some of those things, so great job. Uh, Roman, I have, thank you, Michael. I have a couple. Larry, uh, Larry, yeah, Larry. Go ahead. 
if I may, yes. can we ask the uh, people that aren't speaking to mute their mics, please? There's, yeah, Michael's correct. There's, there's some uh, interference coming through. <laughs> Uh, Roman, I have a couple of uh, questions. Uh, the hostel saloon, that uh, uh, RFP is going on again, is that correct? So that, uh, we're, we're in the process of evaluating that. Um, I have a, a meeting with our evaluation committee and the um, town administrator scheduled for Monday to, to progress with that. Thank you. And secondly, uh, the solar uh, panels, that project's on uh, coming to uh, uh, close, I guess, right now. What's, what's the schedule of replacing uh, or buying the, the uh, moving to solar cars, electric cars? Yep, so uh, that, that again is gonna be covered in our meeting on, on Monday. Um, there's a number of uh, factors involved in that. We, we currently have a, a project out to bid that we're expecting the bids due back this upcoming Thursday to do the electric grid for the car park that, that would be the infrastructure required to support an electric fleet. Uh, according to that bid, we were requiring the work to be done um, by June 30th. So, you know, it, it, that'd be the earliest we'd be able to support an electric fleet this year. There are a lot of other complications that um, due to the pandemic, the, the golf cart companies are behind on production. So I, I, I've been speaking with some vendors and even if we ordered an electric fleet today, uh, they would not be able to deliver until possibly August or later based on production delays. So that, that's something I'm discussing with the town administrator and our procurement team on Monday. And we, we've, had, we've had meetings every week on this one. It, it's a complex issue with a lot of uh, items that need to all come together, but uh, we are still pursuing it for this season. Well, I appreciate your uh, sticking with that. That's all I had. Uh, John, I'll turn it to you. Uh, thank you, Larry. Uh, I'm gonna start off with uh, uh, Mary. Yeah, uh, Roland, I'm not a golfer, so uh, this certainly doesn't come from me, but I was a little surprised to see the increase in revenue, because what I hear around town is it's difficult for members to get a tea time. So I'd like to hear your thoughts on that and how you can increase revenue. Tea times are hard to get. Sure, I'd be happy to address that. Um, you know, due to the pandemic, it, it turns out golf was really the hero of the pandemic where so many other uh, recreational activities were limited or closed. So our, our normal annual pass holders, last year we had approximately the same number of annual pass holders as we always have. So there was no huge increase in the number of annual pass holders that we had at the golf course. They just had, they were here, they weren't traveling, they weren't doing their regular volunteer days at the food pantry and their the regular, you know, part-time jobs that they do and, and things like that. So the same number of annual pass holders wanted to play a lot more golf. And we do anticipate that for this year as well. Um, the, the way that we work our, our T-sheet is we have an allocation for annual pass holders. Those are protected blocks that, that are, have the tee times distributed to our annual pass holders on a priority base, basis uh, using our Chelsea system. I expect this year uh, the, those tee times to be in high demand and, and, and there to be frustrations as well because we're starting the season with limitations still due to the pandemic and, and people are on Cape and not traveling, all the same stuff. So um, I expect our annual pass holder tee times to be in high demand and, and there to still be some level of frustration. Um, as, as the chairman of the Board of Selectmen mentioned, uh, we have at the golf committee level address that with some changes to our Chelsea system to allow the, the allocation of tee times to be more, to address more the, the pressures of the pandemic. So I think they'll be allocated a little bit more fairly this year. Although I, I do believe they were fairly allocated last year. I think that uh, we just tweaked them to address the, the more modern pressures that are on the system. Um, but uh, we're, we're anticipating increased revenues Number one, because we increased our rates, so uh, our, so our uh, green fee numbers will be increased. Our, our car fee numbers will see an increase. Uh, just on the increases to the rates and fees alone, we could see up to a hundred thousand dollar increase on rates and fees for for the next fiscal year, just just by the changes to the rates and fees. But uh, there's also huge demand for our, our public tea times which you know, we, we have an allocation of uh, the highest allocation we've ever given to the annual pass holders based on the demand we're seeing. We're giving the annual pass holders approximately 70% of the T-sheet. 
uh, the 30 percent we use for public sales and and you'll see that you know, when we see our anticipated revenue a uh, huge portion of our anticipated revenue does come from um crane's fee sales that's, that's our largest portion of our revenue so we need to generate that in the 30 percent of the t-sheet that's not dedicated to annual pass holders and uh, we, we think we'll, we'll do a better job of utilizing all those tea times or the majority of them. Uh, they are hard to sell. They're, they're never sold at full capacity because when we begin, you know, the, the true golf season in April, there will be cold, rainy days where those 30% of our tea sheet are, are just hard to sell. But in the summer, they'll sell. On weekends, they'll sell. So uh, we, we do anticipate more uh, usage of the, uh, more sales in those time slots. And uh, we're also seeing an increase in annual pass sales as well. So uh, I, I definitely see revenues trending upward. Thank you very much, Roman. You're welcome. Um, thank you, John. Uh, and uh, I would like to echo Mary's um, question and, and concerns about um, trouble getting a tea time. I heard this, the same complaints from many members last year that they were just overflowed and had trouble, you know, getting tea times more than once a week. Um, so, Roman, I guess my question is: Does does the increase you show from 650 to 700 in resident fees are those an increase in the number of players, or is that an increase in the rate? That that number is is basically taking into anticipating uh, level sales in, in, in annual passes, not increases necessarily. What we are seeing uh, in our early annual pass sales currently for the current fiscal year is an, is an increase on our early sales. I don't know if that's just people getting their money in earlier and it'll be end up being the same number. But um, I, I do agree that there are frustrations I and mean, we're only one 18 hole golf course and there's a lot of people that want to play a lot more golf than they used to in the past. I, I, like I said, the same number of annual pass holders uh, as we had in the past wanted to play possibly three times more golf than they wanted to in the past. So if the, those annual pass holders just want to play golf and, and, and not do their other activities, uh, there will be you know, we'll, we'll rely on our priority based system and there will be situations where, where members are overflowed or waitlisted uh, based on demand but our system is priority based and it'll allocate the tea times fairly and if you were you know um not able to get a tea time for today you'd be a higher priority for tomorrow theoretically so uh, it, it'll, it'll it'll operate fairly i just think um you know it would require a, an investment in the town to to choose not to, per, to pursue the greens fee revenue and and to cut down on our open tea times for sale to accommodate all the demand of the annual pass holders and that's just not something we're pursuing we're, we're, we're pursuing uh generating the revenue that we project by trying to allocate those tea times fairly to the to the annual pass holders in their particular block in which we have expanded but uh, I, I do think that when things open up and things come back to normal, there will be less demand because people will start doing their other activities as well. So I, I don't think there's a reason for us to change course of, of the way we allocate our tea times at this point. There's just going to be a reliance on our system and our policies. Okay, thank you, Roman. I mean, it's a beautiful course. I love playing there, and that's probably part of what's driving the demand. It's one of the nicest courses around. Well, thank you for your uh, answer. Thank you. Uh, uh, Joe? That's it, Dale. Thank you, Dale. Uh, Angelo? Uh, just want to check on one thing. Uh, usually, all the expenses that are used to run the golf course are generated through the revenue. I take it that, once again, this revenue covers all the costs in the town. It's not touching or presenting any money to the, uh, to the golf course um you know the, that to a degree um i think that is true that has historically happened uh there when we look at um the full fully allocated costs that the that carol sends us um, we're not covering those and we have not ever covered those particularly when they when they count into uh, when they take into um consideration previous debt which you know, you know pre-2010 debt uh, which uh if you, if you look at the, the reports that were provided um a lot of that old debt is coming off the books fy 22 will be the last year that we have debt from 
um, pre-2015, but it was a lot of that that is really old, 2004, 2006, that's all being retired by FY22. Uh, so at that point, we're, there, there's really, we're closing the gap based on our revenue projections and, and our fully allocated costs. But uh, um, at this point, no, we, we, we are not fully covering those fully allocated costs. Okay. Uh, Dan? Mute. Yeah, I'm muted. <laughs> yeah, I have no further questions, John. The uh, items I had an interest in were, were, were uh, covered. Thank you, Dan. Uh, Mark? No questions. Uh, thank you. Uh, I have a couple of uh, questions, Roman. And uh, first of all, you know, uh, thanks to, to you and, and the golf committee, Clement, his, uh, his committee members, you know, the to uh, you know, work through these these challenges that we have with tornadoes, pandemics, you know, short tee times. It's, it's a lot of challenges there. Uh, just a couple uh, questions on on the revenue side, which is what the finance committee is usually uh, focused. One of their main focuses is revenues. Uh, the resident fees that you're projecting there of seven hundred thousand. Does that include uh, the Chatham people, the East End people, and the Orleans people that play pay reduced uh, rates? Yes, that, that's an all-inclusive number. It does include include them. And I'm not sure um, if uh, we presented this at, at the Finance Committee level, but uh, on the Golf Committee's le level this year, when we were doing rates and fees, um, the Golf Committee voted on a three-year plan to uh, remove those discounted rates so that it, within three years we'll have Harwich rates and non-resident rates only. So we're, we're working our way out of having those those middle zone uh, discounts for Chad and East Ham and Orleans. Okay. Uh, great, uh, Roman. I, I knew that you and the committee had passed those uh, those increases uh, last year. I attended those meetings and I'm, I'm glad to see that, you know, uh, there was some um, inequity. We're hearing a lot about inequity with school systems. There was some inequity with uh, with the golf rates there. So I'm glad uh, to see you uh, uh, raise those rates. And a three-year time frame is, is, is a great way to, to do that slowly. Uh, so thank you on that. And uh, just a, a last question is, uh, uh, maybe either uh, Joe or yourself can answer it. What's the uh, update on the, if it's been done, the, the power line power upgrade that we had to bring in from the street to the to the building? Has that been finished or is that still ongoing? That, that has been completed. Um, the, the, the upgrade has, has been completed as part of our solar project. The solar vendor that the town engaged uh, um, worked with Eversource and, and paid for it um, out of the, their agreement. So that, that um, power upgrade, bringing three-phase power to the new car barn uh, has been completed. Great, thank you. I know that was another challenge along with tornadoes and, uh, and pandemics, the power upgrade. Uh, that's all I have to say. I am not a golfer, but uh, I do speak to a lot of golfers. And uh, this is a nod to you, uh, Sean. I, I don't know you, but uh, uh, they all comment on the quality and, and, and the, the readiness of the course. So uh, thank you. That's all I have to say, Larry, in the committee. Thank you, John. Uh, Joe? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just wanted to follow up on the discussion as uh, relative to uh, availability of tee times last season uh, as well as this season. And, and I will freely admit there's a little bit of low-hanging fruit that I'm going to take my advantage of, but it does bring to mind the old uh, Yogi Berra quote that he said famously that that restaurant's so busy, no one goes there anymore. Um, and I think that there is an element of that, that joke in play here. Um, you know, to just sort of give some perspective on all of this, um, today is March 13th. Uh, and it, it is exactly to the day, the one year anniversary, where literally everything shut down. And uh, Roman and Sean um, worked uh, diligently to get back online as quickly as was allowed under Governor Baker's protocols at the time. And while I know that we weren't necessarily the first golf courses uh, locally to get fully operational, um, I do know that the data will bear out that uh, Cranberry Valley, Roman, Sean, and their teams uh, did it smarter than most. And so um, that led to a surge in tee times or use of tee times last year 
because um, I think word got out that Cranberry Valley was a place that you could not only go to, but you could go to and be there safely. And so, you know, it, it's worth repeating again. Today, March 13th, 2021, represents the second full day of full operations until carts are available at the golf course. That's a significant change from last year. And last year, there was a, um, um, a gradual increase, if you will, over time of tee times available. I was talking to Roman earlier in the week, and Roman, I know I'm not going to get it right uh, first try here, but I, I recall last year that we were looking at you know, tee times uh, after 9 a.m. and tee times that ended before 5 p.m., and it was a slow but gradual increase. And so what we, what we see this year, because I do take to heart, um, this is the sixth meeting that we've had where we've talked about uh, the estimated receipts for golf. And I, I appreciate everybody's concern, um, but I do take faith and stock in, in Carol, Roman and Sean, uh, among others, you know, being able to say that if this is a year where we get to get more normally, we will see numbers that will match, if not exceed, what we saw prior to uh, the years of just extraordinary events. And so I, I, I remain uh, optimistic and I remain in support of the revenue projections. Um, and, and I just think that the jewel of our golf course uh, will remain that and there will be a lot of pressure to get on there. Uh, there's only only so many tee times you can get into in, 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 a, in a golf day, but. I think the numbers uh, will be borne out over time. Uh, and as always, Carol and I, with Roman and Sean, will keep an eye, a uh, close eye on those revenue projections as well as all the others. Thank you, Joe. Uh, Carol, any comments? I have no comments at this time. Thank you, Carol. And uh, thanks again, Roman and uh, Sean, for being here and, uh, and Clem. Appreciate your, uh, all your efforts and joining our meeting as well. Thank you. We'll move next then to Harbor. John, uh, Harbor Master Rendon, is that the proper title? Yes, sir. How are you doing? Good morning. <clears throat> um, good morning, John Rendon, Harbor Master, uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to um, present our budget. Uh, for the coming year, just a quick summary of the department. Um, we have four full-time staff and three seasonal positions that run our uh, harbors and waterways. Uh, we have no requested uh, additional staff, you know, for FY22. Um, you know, just in a brief overview of, of what we do uh, as a department. Obviously, maritime assistance, emergency response is one of our primary missions. We maintain a 24 uh, by seven uh, ready recall status between myself and the deputy and, and Heinz uh, Prof, the natural resource director really helps in that regard as well. Um, we do enforcement of all our waterways. You know, we have an expansive uh, uh, waterway uh, when you think about our three major harbors, the Herring River, uh, we have presence on Round Cove and Pleasant Bay and, uh, and Long Pond. So we're spread out quite a bit and we try to maintain presence as much as best as we can throughout the um, summer boating season. We manage uh, the municipal marina, 202 slips um, that uh, has a real diverse user group recreational, commercial, charter, passenger boats, and a, and a ferry that runs out of there. Um, and it's a, it's a busy place. Uh, we manage all the permitting. We do a lot of permitting with regard to slips, moorings, offloading permits, user fees, and, and that's an effort. And uh, uh, I think we do it in a, uh, in an organized and uh, fair and transparent manner. Um, we have 600 plus moorings, uh, town moorings that we permit and we, we manage through the use of mooring servicing agents. And, um, and, and, and again, that's uh, 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 a real good service for our public. We have mooring fields all throughout all the waterways that I just mentioned. 
Um, and then we spend a lot of time doing dredging as, as I think everybody knows. We have to dredge our waterways on an annual basis um, and we work real hard uh, uh, with the county dredge to, to schedule and, and to permit and to make that happen in time for the boating season. So that's a quick snapshot uh, of what we do as a department. Um, just real, real quick on, on revenues, um, FY20 was uh, a, a real good uh, year for us from a revenue standpoint. Um, similar to what golf just talked about, though we had this pandemic, uh, our harbors remained open the entire time and we had a record year with regard to uh, revenue for the department. We brought in uh, uh, one point, uh, almost $1.4 uh, million dollars uh, in, in FY20, uh, $1,386,000. Um, that was a $120,000 increase from the previous year and it's uh, about a $320,000 increase from uh, before we started our, our major capital project in renovating our, our harbor um, landside and waterside project. Uh, so our numbers are strong. We were extremely busy last year and I expect we'll be just as busy this coming year. And I say that because in addition to how busy we were, obviously we were in the spending freeze part of that time. And I just want to take my hat off to my staff who uh, worked real hard to keep things open, to keep things safe for all our users, uh, for the public uh, who came and enjoyed the marina during difficult times. And uh, I think it was, I just take my hat off to the work of of Michelle and Bill Neeser, my deputy, and uh, Tom Telesmatic, and of course, Heinz Prof, he, he's up next. I think he'll talk about his program, but he does a lot for the harbors as well. Um, so I, I, I think it's a, it's a success story uh, from my point of view uh, with regards to harbors. Uh, the budget uh, that, that's proposed for FY22, um, uh, again, we complied with the, with, with the standing order of, of having a 0% increase. Um, I won't go line by line, but uh, again, our budget is pretty much level funded um, as directed. Um, salary and wages, like, uh, like everybody, we had a little bit of increase uh, with regards to contractual agreements, but uh, the bottom figure is, is, is no increase because there was no cost of living uh, increases. Um, but if there's any questions, specific questions about the line item uh, of my budget, I'd be happy to, um, to discuss. But again, um, it's pretty much level funded. So if I can answer any questions, I'd be happy to. Thank you, John. Uh, I'll uh, move this over then to uh, Michael. He's uh, either muted or temporarily uh, moved. Uh, Don, I see you've uh, arrived. Thanks. Uh, you caught the end of this. You have questions for Harbor? I question why we're here to hear him, but that's it. Okay. Uh, Ed? Just we Ed has none either. John, I, I have none. It's just terrific job. What a, what a showcase for the town. Very, thank you. Very good. I'll turn it over to you, John. Great. Uh, thank you, Larry. Uh, and uh, thank you, John, for your presentation. I'll open it up to the, uh, our FinCom board members. Uh, Mary? No uh, questions. Just uh, Sacramento is certainly gorgeous with all the improvements. So uh, thank you for a great job. Thank you. Uh, Dale? I, I have no questions. Thank you, John. Angelo? I don't have any questions. 
Okay, uh, 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 Dan. You. <laughs> I don't have any questions, John. Okay, thanks, uh, Mark. I was down there a few times. Great job on the piers. No questions. Thank you, uh, John. Uh, I have a couple of questions, <laughs> and I am a boater. For full disclosure, let get that out there. No golf, but a boaty. Uh, John, uh, uh, you know, it's a great job on running the marina. You know, I can attest to what you said. You know, I was down there practically every day, and, and uh, if I'm if I don't go down there, uh, I drive through there to my house. It's a stop before I come home. I drive through there, and uh, so it's a great job on management. Uh, the folks down there, a compliment to your staff, and 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 everything else down there uh just the and the revenues you know how, how great great uh great news on the revenues and i think this year like golf uh if you listen to the to the to what people are saying boat sales they can't they can't sell boats fast enough they can't get them uh people are are, are turning their money to boating or to golf and uh so and i'm sure uh it's gonna be a busy season down there uh just a, a, a couple questions one on on capital uh I'm not quite sure when uh, you had money in there for, I think it was $2 million uh, for uh, rebuilding or re redoing something to the Allen Harbor uh, jetty. I wasn't sure if that was on the capital this year or next year, but I know uh, we, as the whole town is looking at capital requests. I currently see this on the capital plan out in physical year uh, 26. Yeah, uh, just want to get your thoughts on the on the you know the condition of that uh, breakwater. Do you feel comfortable in you know just a quick overview on the the Allen Harbor breakwater? Sure. Um, well, I, as I think most of you know, we um, hired GEI Consulting to do a uh, a study, uh, a, a site assessment of the West Jetty of Allen Harbor. Um, every year we have to dredge Allen Harbor. Um, part of that reason is because um, we think the jetty, uh, a portion of the jetty is, is, uh, is porous and, and, and just not uh, working as, as it should. We have a significant shoal area, the same spot every year, build up to the point where if we don't dredge, it'll cut off the entrance uh, to the harbor. So. Uh, this past year, um, they've done an assessment. They've written up a draft report that provides some alternatives that will be proposed to the Board of Selectmen on what um, they would suggest uh, on type of, of repair. Uh, we're not talking about extending the jetty. We're not talking about reconfiguring um, the jetty. We're simply talking about trying to um, repair it to make it more effective. Um, and so this was a two-phase uh, capital project. The first was to do the study, the assessment. Part of that is not only the study, but it's coming up with alternatives, a conceptual design, and a finished uh, design. Uh, based upon what the town decides um, uh, what what alternative they pick to repair. Um, and then the follow on was the actual construction. And that's what you see is the $2 million that I had proposed for FY22. I, I know, and I, I won't speak for town administrator, but I believe uh, it was a decision that he made to put that off until FY24. Um, and uh, and I'm fine with that. I, I I don't. I mean, does it need to be done? I think so. Uh, I, I'd be real interested to hear um, GEI's report to the board on on what their findings are. I've read the initial report. I've had some questions with regard to uh, land ownership and where our jetty ends and where the private bulkhead that's out there um starts and so we're trying to get our arms around that before we make um the the presentation but i mean it's kind of a double -ed, double-edged sword you know um we spend a lot of money every year uh dredging allen harbor but at the same time that material that we dredge out, out of allen harbor is pretty critical to nourishing all of our public beaches 
and uh, and it's needed. I have a, a list as long as my arm from private homeowners who would love to purchase <laughs> land from the town to nourish their beaches. And we just don't have enough um, to keep our public beaches nourished and also um, the private. So that that's kind of where we're at with regard to the Allen Harbor jetty. Okay, uh, thank you, John. I just uh, I wanted, and I, I looked at my cap. I misquoted. I, I see it in 25. I thought it was 26, but you're right. Uh, thank you on that. And just a, a quick uh, revenues on the on the the uh, seafood snack shack. There, I, are they doing well? Are they meeting their goals and that sort of thing? Um, they are. You know, the the, the first year um, they well exceeded their. Uh, their revenue projection, uh, the way the lease was set up is if they exceeded um, uh, the projection, then they would pay a percentage uh, on, on top of uh, what their uh, lease agreement was. And uh, and um, I, I don't have all the figures in front of me, I'm sorry, but but I think it was in, they ended up paying the town an additional eight grand or nine grand on top of their lease agreement. And, and again, last year, even through the pandemic, they exceeded. Um, it wasn't quite at the level as the first year, but again, they exceeded their uh, uh, their projection, and they ended up paying the town additional funding, uh, additional money. So um, they remained open. They had to make a, a few adjustments through the pandemic, but but I again, I anticipate this coming year to be very good for them as well. Great. Uh, thank you, John. And no further questions. Great job to you and your staff. Thank you. Thank you, Larry. Well, thank you, John. And uh, Joe, I'll turn it back to you for uh, concluding remarks. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just to build off of what the Harbor Master said regarding the Jetty Project, uh, that was actually a vote uh, specifically of the Capital Outlay Committee. Uh, there was significant debate about that. And uh, given the pressures we had, they decided to push that out a few years. Um, and, and I told them that I would work with our Harbor Master to reevaluate that. Uh, and that uh, we may be making the request to uh, fast track it, uh, if I can use that phrase, recognizing that it was delayed. Um, secondly, uh, as the Harbor Master said earlier, and again, just um, I, I can't miss the opportunity to tie this meeting to exactly where we were a year ago, um, but John's absolutely correct in that uh, with all of the governor's protocols and all of the shutdowns, harbors were not shut down. And, and while that is potentially a good thing, I know it put significant pressure on John uh, and his team to staff while we had a, a hiring freeze and a spending freeze. Um, they didn't uh, so-called gain any relief by a shutdown. They were uh, fully operational throughout the entire thing. So uh, when our harbor master talks about their success last year, I want to emphasize that it was against some significant headwinds uh, because they were always operational, um, even in the teeth of the uh, pandemic, and um, and we really didn't know what that was going to do to it for impact. So um, John and his team really did excel for their efforts last year. And um, again, I take comfort that even though we are still in pandemic, I think we've all learned enough lessons that we know how to operate against protocol, or I should say, in, in cooperation with protocol to still get services done and no better example of that than John and his team. Thank Thanks, you, Joe. Joe. Uh, Carol? I have no comments at this time. Thank you, Carol. Yeah, thanks again, John. Larry? We, uh, we look forward to getting out in the water again. I, I know that's a fact. Larry? Uh, yes. Uh, this is Michael. Uh, uh, when Michael? you called on me earlier, my computer had froze. So I just wanted to okay. uh, thank, John, thank John and his staff the harbor operation is, is uh, in my mind, run flawlessly and uh, uh, a huge operation with a, with a small staff and uh, a very serious responsibility. But um, great budget, John. Thank you for your efforts in that. And, and thank you for all you do at the harbor and your staff. Thanks, Mike. Thank you, Michael. You also gave me some comfort that I'm not the only one that occasionally has a computer problem. <laughs> Operating remotely today, and it's a terrible Wi-Fi signal, so bear with me. Okay. Uh, thanks again, John. And we'll move next then to uh, Natural Resources and uh, Heinz Proft. Oh, good morning. Can you hear me? I can. 
All right, good morning uh, to all Mr. Chairman, board members, committee members. Um, Heinz Prop, Natural Resources Director. Um, I'll give you an overview of the department and some of the things that we experienced over the past year. You know, not only am I Natural Resources Director, I'm also Shellfish Constable, Herring Warden, and have some responsibilities as an Assistant Harbor Master. It's interesting, I, I've been on since the beginning of the meeting and you know, where we were a year ago and how it affected many departments, but how golf uh, experienced an increase, the harbor certainly is busy, if not busier. And one of the things that people could do, especially in March, April, May, is everyone's finding their ways to go shell fishing and to go shell fishing, you need a shell fish permit. And we, for the longest time, have done those in person across our counter and working with our IT department and the use of our website, we were able to shift quite quickly our shellfish permit sales to online. So people were able to acquire those online and mail them to them. And certainly March, April, and into May, there was an increase in our shellfishing flats. So that was one thing that the town experienced. In terms of permit sales on a year-round basis, we were up 15% selling shellfish permits. And I'm not sure if that'll all continue into 2021. We had a strong start. I mean, there's some stickability, meaning returning people that maybe just got their permit for the first time last year. But the shellfish flats were busy and there were pressure on our shellfishing flats. Um, Mother Nature put shellfish out on the flats, but the town of Harwich, through the Natural Resources Department, we run the uh, shellfish lab where we raise oysters and cohogs through our aquaculture lab at Witchmere Harbor. And that was another thing that we had to adapt within the Natural Resources Department is usually I'll hire three high school students and a teaching supervisor to help manage and run that lab, especially in July and into August. And due to the COVID protocols and restrictions, I had to adjust, but I was still able to manage a season through the shellfish lab by having uh, my teaching supervisor and, able, and her husband, because they lived together, to help manage and make a successful run at the lab last year and provide more shellfish to our flats in the fall. So I was happy that that took place. Uh, another impact that I felt was in the water quality the monitoring that Natural Resources Department does. Yes, I do some myself, which I did continue to do in our harbors and in the river. Uh, but we have an extensive volunteer water quality monitoring program, which involves over 30 to 40 people in the town. And I had to curtail that because of the interaction of bottles and data sheets and so forth. But there were a couple groups that I gave a kit and basically said, you know, politely, I don't want to see you until October and just record some basic, you know, temperature, dissolved oxygen, turbidity readings. So I got some of that too, but heading into 21 here into this upcoming summer, I plan everything to be fully operational, whether it be water quality, say I built the shellfish lab, um, running the department I normally have with pairing migration and eels and things like that. Uh, I know we're here to discuss the budget. It's fairly straightforward. I complied with the level funding that was requested uh, in order to meet those contractual needs. There is a decrease in one line item, which uh, reads shellfish seed supplies. Uh, which is very fortunate that you know within natural resources, I have a line item to purchase shellfish seed, but I also have some other resources, which include uh, a mitigation fund that through the conservation department when docks and piers are requested sometimes there's a mitigation requirement which they provide funds for me then to raise shellfish seed and replenish an area that may have been impacted. We also have had uh, a gift account that opened in the last past year and a half where there are funds in there to acquire additional seeds. So I am able to still run 100% of what I need to run at the shellfish lab in terms of uh, supplying oysters and cohogs and shellfish seed to our flats. Um, I think I've kind of rambled on a bit here, but I'll certainly continue if there's something specific somebody would like to ask about natural resources, water quality, shellfish, herring, extended marine mammals, or anything in uh, the line items provided in the budget. Thank you. Thank you, Heinz. I'll move with your questions in. Uh, Don? I don't have any. Thank you. Uh, Michael? No questions, just uh, thank you, Heinz, great job. And, and the, uh, the, gift, the gift account thing, you know, thank the people that are donating. Uh, I think on behalf of the board, thank the people that are donating, because I know that the, uh, 
the job that you do in, in, in implanting, there's a lot of conversation about how great it is uh, for people that are going cohog in the town of Harwich. So uh, only other question would be, I know you, you uh, there was a pilot uh, pilot program you were talking about in Scallops and Herring River. Is that is that working? Is that expanding? Is that um, moving forward? So that Scallop uh, pilot study, uh, proof of concept type work, did take place in Herring River. It takes place underneath a uh, float or raft. So it doesn't impact any kind of water navigational issues. It's underneath the footprint of a dock. Um, it went well. It went well enough that they're going to expand to try a few more of those underneath that same flow. What one thing that they had to, to deal with, which they were prepared for, but not to the degree that it occurred, and that is the strength of the current up and down Herring River at maximum flood, maximum ebb tide. So they're going to have to adjust that somewhat because think of an underwater windsock. I mean, that at some times was, you know, horizontal to the to the bottom. So they're going to have that a little bit of weight and somehow tied off in a couple different ways, but that's minimal considering a project like that. So it'll continue and go forward. And when I say expand, it, it slightly expand. It's not gonna be a tremendous change at this point. Thanks. Heinz, is there any opportunity? I mean, I guess where I was going with that, is there any opportunity for Harwich residents? I know, I know in other towns they do uh, quite well with oysters and some towns do mussels. Is there any opportunity for us to have limited permits for any sort of aquaculture or kel uh, kelp line expansions, anything like that? Um, very, very minimal, very, very little of that could take place in Harwich based upon the acreage that we have along our shorelines where generally that stuff occurs. So we have over 400 shellfish permits that we, we issue, and that's to the general public, and some commercial fishermen in Herring River. Uh, so we're not blessed with the same shoreline, let's say, that Dennis would have, or Troy, or Wealthy, these big expanse of flats that you could, you know, cut out an acre, or half an acre, and assign to someone to utilize and run. What Howard has possibly is deeper water offshore, beneath the water, you know, above the, the substrate, on a limited basis based upon time of year, equipment they're using. Harwich has two aquaculture um, operations. They're private. One is, I'm sure most people are familiar with, is the ARC building, Gulf Weller, uh, the Wixon property. And then there's a privately run one in Allen Harbor, again, also on private property. So they have, there's shellfish that takes place like that, aquaculture land base. The town has its own land base at Witchmere, but aquaculture sites as they are generally interpreted or, or pictured we don't have that amount of shoreline availability or seasonality based upon other uses where someone on a large scale could do something you mentioned the kelp project i think it's in its third year the first year i didn't you know the report from from that uh operational owner didn't go well he moved a little closer to uh the mouth of hair river thinking maybe the nutrients would be better. Uh, he'll report that. And there may, he has a, that, he's added a few lines of some scallops through uh, permission through natural resources to cover it under my permit on a limited basis, but I wouldn't do anything large scale uh, through natural resources. That would have to be done on their own. But uh, we just don't have large scale operational commercial viable aquaculture in, in, in the way you describe it. Thank you, Heinz. Great job. Thank you. Uh, Ed? Yeah, Heinz, the, uh, the um, fellow who's doing, the people that are doing the scallop uh, um, experiments, are, are they um, the folks that are doing it down in Bourne and Falmouth? Uh, yes, if you're referring to Ward Aquaculture, because yeah. I think it's all probably because one with Mr. Kelleher, who's adding some of his kelp line, and then Ward Aquaculture is the one that is under a uh, already uh, existing dock and pier and flow. And what they're doing is trying to work underneath the flow, utilizing the current underneath there, bringing nutrients back and forth through a hanging bag of scallops to see what they can get in terms of survival and growth rate uh, in those conditions there. So, yeah. Okay. 
and, and real quick, they're in the process of doing a biological survey, and then they're going to bring their full proposal in front of possibly waterways, which may or may not have to, to address it, uh, conservation commission, certainly, natural resources, and at that point, if it continues and you know has the possibility or uh, some legs, it will then come to the board selectman, but it'll be certainly surely vetted and thoroughly reviewed by the time you guys get it. Yeah, that was a, a project that was initially funded by a, a grant by the uh, Barnstable County um, Economic Development Council. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Go ahead, uh, uh, John. Uh, uh, thank you, Larry. Uh, Mary? Uh, no, uh, no questions, uh, Heinz, but thank you uh, for a great education this morning. That was very helpful. Oh, I appreciate that. Thank you, Brian. Uh, Dale? Um, yeah, thank you, John. Uh, thank you, Heinz. Yeah, it was a very educational presentation. It was very interesting. Um, I have my question is more out of curiosity, I think, than anything, but you have a line item for technology with a budget amount of about 12.5. Five. Can you explain how technology is applied to natural resources? Yeah, that, that line item, professional tech services. The town of Harvard has a water quality monitoring program in which we monitor our harbor, harbors, plural, Herring River, and many of our freshwater ponds. We're able to get the baseline data, which includes dissolved oxygen, temperature, sexy reading, which is turbidity. But in order to get those higher type of nutrients like uh, phosphorus, nitrogen, chlorophyll, those samples are analyzed by the UMass's Dartmouth School of Marine Science and Technology. And that line item covers that analysis. It costs about $55 per uh, saltwater sample, uh, sorry, for freshwater, about $100 for saltwater. And we pick both surface and bottom readings for that. So that's really what that is. It's, it's paying for the analysis of those higher end uh, nutrient requirements that we need for our water sampling program. Oh, well, that's a, that's a critical activity. Thank you. Thank you. Hello? Uh, I don't have any questions. Thank uh, Dan? Well, I have no questions, thank you. Uh, Mark? Any, any update on the herring count this year? <laughs> uh, no, that's a great question. So uh, two years ago, uh, so 2019, Harwich was the largest uh, herring count in the state of Massachusetts. We were over a million fish. Last year, we were at 900 and some thousand. Now, I haven't gotten all the other towns or the data, but either we're, we're number one again or certainly near the top in terms of quantity of herring coming up Herring River. Um, I just uh, this past Wednesday, I, I'm also responsible for clearing the debris and brush and blockages along the uh, waterways uh, from basically Nantucket Sound all the way up to Long Pond, the largest freshwater body on Cape Cod, where those herring will migrate to. So uh, next Friday, I have the AmeriCorps. It's eight to 10 college kids also in waders working with me in the river to clear the, the way for the passage of herring. We're also fortunate that the Division of Fisheries has utilized our herring ladder as a place to do an electronic count. So those numbers that I mentioned are very accurate. It's a count that takes place 24 hours a day, seven days a week uh, for the months of really uh, April and May and into the first part of June when the herring are done migrating. So we're getting ready for another, you know, strong year, I would think of the herring count. We haven't spotted them yet. Historically, they'll show up around March 22nd, 23rd, the first couple. We call them scouts. They really don't go back to the population of fish and communicate in any way. But then there's a slight pause. And then in uh, April and May, those are the two strongest months for the herring to uh, to come up and migrate. So nothing yet, but it's a little early. Thanks, Mark. Uh, just one quick question, Heinz. Great job with the, the, the Department of One, really. And, uh, and I and I and I read about the, uh, the your successful herring clearing up on the uh, Hinkley's Pond area. It's it's great to see volunteers get out there. So no other further questions. Thanks again. Yeah, I was just kind of, the town of Howard, I'm sure many of our departments would would echo this. We have such a great diverse kind of citizenship within Howard, and certainly when it comes to water quality and shellfishing and herring and eels, I have gotten so much uh, support. Physically, people showing up and helping you if and when needed 
to the point that I even have some volunteer shellfish wardens that help patrol the shellfishing flats because the tide, you know, waits for no man, whether it be weekends, early, late. Uh, but I have gotten great support from the people of Harwich in many of my endeavors. Thanks. Thank you, Heinz. Uh, Joe, concluding? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'd just like to go back to uh, what Heinz said early on. Uh, I, I recall it was closer to the summer, but when he came to me, um, and I think this is a great example of how uh, many of our department heads work, he, he came to me with a problem uh, that he already had a solution to. And so the problem was uh, the individuals that help him in the summertime were impacted uh, by the restrictions, meaning uh, they weren't in the same bubble. They, they wouldn't be able to operate under the restrictions that we had. And so his solution was brilliant, uh, in my opinion, because of its simplicity and brilliant because of its execution and, and outcome for him. And that was find a married couple that was willing to work together. No small feat, but uh, paid dividends uh, for Heinz. And again, it just gets back to uh, the creative and um, smart approaches that our teams have have, uh, have demonstrated throughout the pandemic. Thank you, Jill. Uh, Carol? I have no comments at this time. Thanks again, Heinz. Thank you. Next on the agenda is Channel 18. Uh, Jamie, you want to uh, take this? Good morning, everyone. How are you? Um, I'm Jamie Goodwin. I'm the Channel 18 station manager. Um, we're a department of two full-time employees, myself and Caleb Ledoux, who's actually running this meeting today. Um, we do have a part-time employee, a videographer, Jack Wyatt. We were unable to use him a lot this year due to our you know, pandemic operations, um, which we're happy to report. We have, have not missed a, a single public meeting uh, Caleb and I had been working on a remote meeting set up for some time before the pandemic hit, so we were able to have a, a fairly decent transition into covering remote meetings. Uh, in the beginning, we did help a lot of boards and committees and staff members navigate go to meeting. A lot of people hadn't um, used the platform before, so we spent a little bit of our time walking some people through that. Um, our budget is level funded this year as per the directive from the Board of Selectmen and the administration office. Uh, the changes I did make were to reflect the actual spending to the budget line items. So you may have seen that some things had been moved around and that's to reflect like the actual spending of the previous years. So I'd be happy to entertain any questions on my budget. Thank you, Jamie. I'll go first to uh, uh, Ed. No, Jamie, you do, as always, a wonderful job. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, Don? What Ed said, Jamie, do a great job. <laughs> Michael? Uh, just to echo what I've said to all the other department heads, great job, Jamie. We're all in, in agreement. It's been a, I hope it's been a, a great experience because you obviously had a lot of experience this year. Larry. A job. Ed? I need to sign up for drone flying lessons from Caleb. <laughs> you know, he's, he's, he's listening. I gotta give him all the compliments. He's really good at that drone, but we haven't had a lot of opportunities to use it. So we're, that's on our list for this coming summer. Get out and about a little bit more. <laughs> we'll watch for it. Uh, John, we we'll move to Finn time. Thank you, Larry, uh, and, and Jamie for your presentation. Uh, Mary? No questions, just uh, I've always been impressed with Jamie and Channel 18, so thank you for the good work. Thank you, Mary. Uh, Dale? Um, no questions, just, just kudos, Jamie. I don't know how you get so much accomplished with a team of two. It's just incredible, but thank you. Thank you. It's a, a lot of Caleb Ledoux. He's, um, he's been very uh, quick and efficient with every task I've given to him, so. Very yeah. good, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, uh, 
I thought you were going to go to Angelo. Uh, uh, good job, Jamie. I don't, I don't have any questions. Uh, you do a great job. Thanks, Dan. Angelo? Uh, no question. Okay. Uh, Mark? No questions. Thanks for making us look good. Okay. Uh, again, Jamie, thank you. Uh, to, yes, to, to Caleb and you. And, uh, and Jamie and Caleb, is one of the, or K, Jamie's one of those folks that alluded to that people are asking her questions. I ask her a lot of questions, and she <laughs> hasn't hung up on me yet. So uh, <laughs> thank you, Jamie. I mean, it's, 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 it is challenging. It is challenging, and I appreciate all that you and Caleb do. And uh, I'm going to be sending you more stuff shortly. So thanks again. No, no other problem. questions, sorry. Uh, Joe, I'll turn to you for concluding remarks. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, you know, again, it, it's, it can't be overstated. Um, the work that Jamie and Caleb have done to keep government going um, in a full and transparent manner throughout the pandemic uh, is extraordinary, especially when you can consider at the height of the pandemic, when everybody had to work remotely, uh, Jamie took the initiative to make sure she could do that safely without any disruptions whatsoever. We're talking about a time when the board was meeting multiple nights in the same week. And so uh, she and Caleb uh, have earned all of the, uh, the well wishes and the congratulations from everybody today. But I also want to point out that Jamie has been diligently working on a major project on behalf of the town. And that is the renegotiation of our decennial contract with Comcast. Um, I don't know that Jamie has a, a legal background, but she has handled the uh, negotiations uh, with the adept counsel of Bill August uh, exceedingly well and uh, brought me in only as necessary. So for that, I'm grateful. Uh, but we will, we will eventually conclude a contract uh, that is beneficial for the town because of Jamie's early uh, action and advocacy for Channel 18 and, and all that we need them to do. So I just want to put that out there in the public sphere of the, the great work that Jamie's done in that regard as well. Thank you, Thank you Joe. Uh, Carol? Um, hi, I just wanted to point out that um, all 100% of the Channel 18 budget is funded from the PEG Access Fund. So it's public education government um, that those funds come from Comcast, um, that, which is the contract that's currently being negotiated. But um, but just to let you know, no taxpayer dollars are funding this operation. Thank you, Carol. I'm glad you, you reminded us of that. Uh, Jamie, thanks again. And Caleb, uh, we can't see him because he's behind the camera, but uh, he's a good looking fellow. So we'll, look, we'll see you next time. Next on the agenda is uh, water and wastewater. Uh, Dan? Good morning. Is that uh, microphone okay? It's a new set of headphones today. Uh, the volume's a little low for me. All right, let me try to take them out and see if it gets better. Can you hear me? I can. But I can't hear you. Hold on. All right, I think I'm back in. My apologies. Technical difficulties. All right. So jumping right in, um, I guess we'll start at the top with um, salary and wages line item. Um, and I know I believe I sent an email to the chair of both boards um, just letting you know that I was made aware of a retirement that's anticipated this next fiscal year and I may be presenting a change. After going through and calculating the changes um, or savings we'll realize by bringing in a new employee at a lower grade and step, I won't actually need to be requesting anything additional as to what's being presented. Um, one other adjustment though that is incorporated within that is the an additional $2,000 in the elected officials line item to um, cover the additional two water wastewater commissioners that will be coming on next year. And um, so moving down, we also had additional decreases in salary and wages due to new employees coming on and more senior staff retiring. So you see a decrease there. 
Um, another reason for that decrease is some of the salary and wages was moved over to the wastewater operating budget to cover um, things like meter reading and some of the administrative uh, functions that will just be uh, incorporated into some of the current water staff's workforce or work uh, duties. We also had a, a decrease in our seasonal salary and wages line item because we removed uh, one of the seasonal positions, realizing that oftentimes we don't get as many as we, we hope we will. Um, sometimes it's hard to compete and get, get kids out to paint hydrants. Um, moving on, we also had decreases in overtime, again, due to the new um, staff, as well as longevity from recent retirements and same with uh, overtime. So if there's no questions on salary and wages, I can go through to the expenses. Um, again, uh, if you would like me to go line by line, I can, but at, at the end of the day, we're at uh, a little less than 0% from last year. Um, some of the big increases, I guess we can highlight, um, we did increase our technical support agreements um, that was because we did purchase a new work order software this year. Um, and we also increased some of our uh, IT subscriptions for uh, virus protection or things of that nature. Um, another fairly large increase was the building maintenance agreements. And that was to cover um, the COVID cleanings that, that we've been having to um, do and, and where they're no longer reimbursed. Um, we also carried additional uh, money in our sampling line item. Uh, starting next month, the department's going to be required to sample quarterly for PFAS. So we incorporated um, funds to cover that expense. And the other utility items like electric and things of that nature um, were carried from our current year and projected out because we did have one of the highest years of pumping this year. So we, we used um, that as our basis as to not underrun next year. I guess with that, I would turn it back for any questions. Thank you, Dan. I'll uh, start with you, Don. Uh, it's not so much a question, it's just an observation and not, not so much for the folks here, but for the public uh, watching. Um, you're an enterprise fund, right, Dan? Yep. And it's driven by ratepayers? Entirely. Okay, that, that, so that, that's the first thing. Uh, secondly, I think I've asked this before, but uh, it's worth asking again, especially with the pandemic, a lot of people sought refuge on the Cape. Uh, I'm gathering that you saw that in terms of how much pumping you had to do. Yeah, so the majority of our, we did have a record year this year, and um, I was actually looking at the data yesterday. So for the month of January for 21 in comparison to 20, um, we pumped an additional 5 million gallons over what we did last year. But then looking at February, we pumped almost exactly um, what we pumped last year in February. And as far as month to date in March, we're also identical um, to where we were last year. So I'm interested to see, you know, what this translates uh, to in the spring in the summer in, in comparison to where we were pre-pandemic and, and during pandemic. Yeah, I think by February, a lot of people were already heading out of cities uh, trying to find a place where they can hunker down. So I, you're probably right. You're going to need to see a second cycle and see what it compares to. Yeah. Thank you. You do a great job. An admirable job, actually, uh, especially with the duties you're picking up uh, with the soaring and having to plan out a lot of things. I mean, you're part of Joe's team of five, which I, I truly appreciate in terms of the uh, the, the fresh perspective you're bringing to that stuff. Thank you. Thank you, Don. Michael? I just echo Don's comments, um, you know, especially as related to sewer. Some of us fought hard for two and a half years to get Dan a seat at the table. Uh, and I think that the, t the team is great, and, and Dan in particular with his knowledge. Um, I know when we hired you, Dan, you had, you had knowledge in, in wastewater, and, and I know the original uh, applicator of the um, job description included wastewater. So I appreciate mo you more than you know, and, and we're giving residents real information. And I think you do a great job running your department. And I look forward to um, merging these two departments together. And, and uh, 
instead of creating another uh, another infrastructure and another team that we don't need. So thank you, Dan. Thank you, Tom. Ed? Well, well I, I have no questions at this time. John, I'll turn it to you. Uh, thank you, Larry, and, uh, and thanks, Dan, for your presentation. Uh, Mary? Um, I have a question, Dan, just a comment that uh, from the discussions at the selectmen's meeting, I'm incredibly impressed with what you do and uh, how you present it. So uh, thank you, and I hope to learn more about water and wastewater. Thank you. You can come uh, down anytime. Okay. Dale? Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, John, and, and thank you, Dan, for your presentation. It was, uh, it was very interesting. I just have one quick question. There's an expense item called building, it looks like building agreement. It's going from 9650 up to 22750. Can you help me understand that? Yeah, so that that is the cover uh, cover the cost of the daily COVID cleaning. So we have um, Made Pro is the service that we're using. They come in and about sixty six dollars a day, but they come in and do the COVID cleaning, the disinfecting, all the file cabinets, things of that nature. So that's that's the bulk. That's the entirety of that increase. Got it. Thank you, uh, Angelo. No question. Uh, Mark. No questions. Uh, and uh, Dan, uh, really, no questions. Just to thank you. You know that, that you've helped me understand a lot about the water department and the wastewater. And and I know, you know, I'll thank the general public out there. I know a lot of public call you for questions and stuff like that to help you sort through, this, especially the wastewater. Uh, issues. So thank you to you and your crew. That's it, Larry. Uh, Dan, did you, you have yeah. more to do? Yeah. I do. <laughs> I got another one. <laughs> so, all right. so the wastewater budget has a little bit, I guess, although it's smaller at this point, has more complexity to it given um, where we're at starting the collection system and where we're at in terms with negotiating with Chatham and, and trying to bring contract operations into the picture. Um, so you'll notice some big increases over last year. Um, last year, we had budgeted and anticipated that we would be starting the collection system um, within the current fiscal year. Obviously, that didn't happen. Um, schedules push it out, so now we're looking at that June-July time frame. So the expenses within the operating budget are intended to encompass a full um, full fiscal year of operating the collection system. Now, I would just like to also point out that there's a number in there for contract operations for the day-to-day -day management of our system. Um, that figure right now is about 185,000, but that is only a placeholder. And it's a placeholder due to um, the IMA and where we're at with Chatham and how we're negotiating the operations. So just for an update as to where we're at right now, um, after we had the IMA meeting with Chatham, I think it was a week or two ago, we, we discussed, um, you know, how we wanted to go about it. So Wesson and Sampson has provided uh, myself with a scope of services, which I'm going to be bringing to the Water Wastewater Commission uh, at their meeting next week provided that they uh, are in support of that services, scope of services, I'll be sending that um, with a letter to the town of Chatham requesting that they negotiate with uh, Weston and Sampson for an amendment to their contract. So that's where, and, and once we get to that point, we'll be able to rise, uh, revise that contract operations figure. And in our recent conversations, I do anticipate it will go down. So I'm hoping that, um, we'll realize that and we'll have that information soon. So I guess with that, um, I would open it up to any questions. I know it's, uh, it's a new budget and there's probably some good questions, so. Thank you, Dan. Uh, Michael? Uh, Michael may be frozen again. Uh, Dan? Or Don, rather. <laughs> Thank you, Frank. Uh, <laughs> like, likewise, uh, this is a, a mirror image. I mean, uh, it's it's also 
enterprise fund driven, but like water right now, you have expenses that you're incurring, but you have really no flow revenues because there's not anybody hooked into the system. Just so everybody understands that because this is a, a pure startup. Okay. Uh, thank you, John. I think Michael's back on. Michael? I am back on. Thank you, Larry. Um, thank you, Dan. Same, same thank yous as before. Um, looking at the budget, though, um, so projected budget, didn't we take money or give money back that we didn't use the year before on this budget? So I guess give back. So any, well, any money that was in a prior fiscal year's uh, wastewater enterprise budget would have been certified for retained earnings. And I believe if I'm not mistaken, there's about 200,000 in retained earnings in the sewer account right now. So, and I guess that's my question. It, you know, if it goes back, it, it stays in that budget or it goes back into the general fund. It, it stays within that budget. So it's essentially like a, a, a separate savings account where if you don't use it, it gets in, put into that account and then needs to be reappropriated um, through town meeting. Okay, and wasn't there a recent vote by the water commissioners to use a percentage of that budget for the CAD modeling that we did not uh, decide to bring back to town meeting for a vote? Yes. All right, and and I guess my point is, you know, as we as we go forward, I don't think we should be borrowing money out of this uh, account for anything, because it's my understanding that we're going to be oper operating this system on a deficit for for quite some time because of lack of hookups, and and not having the flow that we originally negotiated to Chatham. Is that correct? Yeah. So I guess my comments really are related to or directed towards the board. Um, to the to the wet water wastewater commission is that I think it, a, a lot of thought needs to be given before we're taking money out of this account for anything besides operations. Well, I think I think too if I can just add, I guess another component to the the conversation about use of the funds, um, where we're bringing the collection system online, a, a portion of those funds should be retained for capital because while the system is new, you know things break and there's going to need to be um, capital appropriations, um, you know, at some point in the future, it may be five years, um, but, but the having those funds available would help stabilize uh, sewer rates, right? So if we're, if we have money to, to, to work with, we're not going to have to raise rates to offset expenses. So I would just, well, we could, you know, do both. <laughs> Given, given, Dan, given the um, complexity of this and, and being brand new, I mean, we're not reinventing the wheel. We've done this with the water, but I think you're 100 percent right. And I, and I think in, in some cases on some of our free cash, we should be tucking money into this uh, account rather than taking anything out of it to begin with, because this is based on the, the, the new projection of flows to Chatham. Um, the costs are going to be quite different than originally anticipated. So I, I would agree with you on the capital and I would agree with you um, in general on this. So thank you, Dan. Yep. Uh, Ed? Hello. Uh, I'm fine. Yeah. Thank you, Dan. I, I just say I do appreciate you working with Chatham and uh, Western Samson to not try to uh, to go on our own and take advantage of uh, a joint operation with Chatham to uh, save money, make it uh, more efficient. So uh, uh, I appreciate that. Uh, John, I'll turn it to you. Uh, thank you, Larry, and thank you, Dan, for your uh, presentation. Uh, Mary? No questions. Thank you, Dan. Uh, Dale? I have no questions. Thank you. Yeah. Ah, didn't come through initially. Uh, John, I don't have any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Angelo? I don't have any questions. Okay. Mark? No questions. 
Okay. Uh, I really don't have any questions either. Uh, thank you, Dan. And uh, like uh, like Don mentioned, it's uh, you are a startup, <laughs> and uh, with and uh, and as uh, as Mike mentioned, with no revenues coming in. So it will. We'll see how it, how it plays itself out. I'm sure it'll all work out well, but thank you again for your help that you give me personally. Thank you. Uh, yes, Dan, I think you mentioned, and as John's uh, mentioned, and Michael asked some questions about, this is a uh, moving target, so we'll have to keep watching it. It's uh, changing almost daily, it seems. Uh, Joe, concluding? Um, I would be remiss if I didn't take the chance to confirm what's been said earlier. Uh, Dan is a, um, a valued part of the executive management team, if you will. Um, uh, I think we partner uh, very well and collaboratively. And uh, Dan, Griffin, Carol, Megan, uh, joining me on that uh, informal task force has paid dividends. And uh, we continue to do great effort and really with the direction of Dan uh, on the topics to be evaluated and the bring, things to bring next to the board and to the public. So. Um, I just want to stay publicly on the record. I appreciate and, and value the collaborative relationship that Dan and I have for the benefit of everybody in the town. And Carol, uh, I know this is one item that we worry out on, where you out on in terms of uh, estimated revenues and budgets. And uh, so I appreciate your effort. It's been a, uh, it's a big chore. Uh, any comments? I have no comments at this time. Thank you, Carol. And thanks again, Dan and uh, Griffin. Uh, we didn't get a chance to talk to you, but thanks to you for your efforts on this as well. Supporting my team. Thank you, everybody. Next is the uh, police. And I see we have Chief uh, Gilman. Uh, you moved on my screen, so I can't quite see. Uh, now I got you in front of me. Okay, Chief. <laughs> and we got the Deputy Chief, Kevin. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Morning, <clears throat> morning, everyone. Uh, Chairman Shorey, members of the uh, the committee, uh, Chief Dave Gilmet, Chief of Police. Um, just as a way of leading, I uh, I want to thank uh, the town administrator for reminding everybody that this is the one year anniversary of uh, of our experience with the COVID uh, pandemic, and to say that that was uh, and created. Uh, one of the most challenging times for uh, police would be an understatement. Uh, it was uh, looking back on those early days uh, is just totally surreal. And um, I, I just want to say I can't I can't say enough uh, as to how proud I am of the reaction of the men and women of the Harwich Police Department and how they. They didn't miss a beat, stepped up, and continued to uh, get out there and respond to emergencies and make a difference in the community. Um, they just absolutely did not miss a step uh, in the face of, of incredible uncertainty, risk, and uh, in many cases, loss. I think we probably all know uh, at this point somebody who we have lost to, to uh, COVID, and a lot of them are, are, are police officers across the, across the state. So. Um, it's definitely been a very, very challenging year uh, for the police department. Um, and, and those challenges continue uh, for us uh, with, with this budget process. But I definitely need to mention uh, the efforts of, uh, of my administrative assistant, Kate Farley and Deputy Chief Considine in, uh, in putting together this, this budget uh, for FY22, an extremely challenging process that we participated in um, you we'll get into it in a minute, but, um, I, I just, you know, one of the things they say about leaders is surround yourself with intelligent people, uh, smarter than you are. And I've been lucky to be able to do that with deputy chief Constantine and Kate Barley. I think Kate Barley could probably give this briefing with her eyes closed. Um, that's how well she knows this budget, but I truly appreciate their help, uh, on this. And, um, I think we have, um, um produced a budget that we can we can work within uh it's it's going to create some some challenges but uh, i think we can do it so uh with that being said our starting point for the level to meet the level funded mandate was obviously uh, you can see on the sheet there it was our total budget for fy 21 was four million six hundred eight thousand five hundred thirty three so that was our starting point unfortunately we were facing a perfect storm of um uh, salaries and wages increases 
uh, as a result of contractual three collective bargaining agreements who are, uh, each of the three are in their third year. Uh, so that's basically the highest year for each one of those collective bargaining agreements and the contractual increases that go along with that. Um, so one of the most important things we need to note is that um, those true increases are not really reflected on uh, on your paperwork there. Uh, what we ended up facing was approximately $225,000 number that we had to reduce the budget by, $225,000. So we made several attempts uh, at cuts um, and as you might imagine, um, you know, policing is a very personnel heavy uh, undertaking. So about 89% of our budget is salaries and wages, 89%. So we're not gonna be able to find $225,000 in offset area within our expense budget. So it's gonna to have to, the majority of it's gonna to have to come out of salary and wages. So um, after looking at it, it became readily apparent that that was going to mean uh, looking at positions. Uh, currently, uh, we are we have two vacant positions in the Irish Police Department, and those positions I'm uh, going to recommend not be funded to try and meet the level funded mandate. So that is a total of uh, those positions is a total of 133,097. So that 133,097 figure actually has to be added to that salaries and wages number that you see um, on the single sheet here on the budget uh, town operation budget page under salaries and wages, which reflects a 93,605 uh, and a 2.3%. The only reason that reads that is because it's it's not including the two full-time positions uh, that aren't being funded. In addition to that, that's obviously did not get us there completely, but in addition to that, uh, we decided not to request the one cruiser we were going to request, which is a $60,000 uh, item. And we also were able to realize uh, $33,000 uh, cut, uh, further cuts in expenses. So um, with those three big items, we were able to meet the $225,000 number and come in uh, level funded. Um, that's basically it in a nutshell. I'm, I'm certainly sure you have some questions. Thank you, Chief. Uh, Ed, I'll start with you. you you've indicated it, you are putting off uh, uh, getting a cruiser. Are, are we uh, replacing any cruisers this year? No, that would be zero cruisers replaced. Um, I think the deputy uh, can comment a little further on that, but due to the the um, spending freeze and some other circumstances, we find ourselves in a position where for this one particular year, we can do it and not be hurt too badly. Uh, deputy, you want to comment any further on that? Yeah, Chief, thank you. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, Mr. McManus, we're in, um, we are in good shape uh, based on how we've been um, utilizing our cruisers uh, mileage wise. Um, we're authorized current fiscal year to purchase one. Um, I've held off on that. We're finishing the procurement on that now. I held that off on purpose till the end of this fiscal year to get us through next year. That will tremendously help us. Um, we are also purchasing a second one um, due to one being in a crash um, last July 5th. So um, that's being covered by insurance and that will obviously go a, 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 a highway to uh, um, give us essentially two cruises this year new in this year's fiscal budget. Okay. On, on a uh, nor normal basis, uh, uh, do we normally replace multiple cruisers or just one? 
the year? Um, yeah, over the last few years, um, and obviously better fiscal times, uh, we were doing two to three in our cruiser replacement program. And, and what's important to remember on that as well is, is you know, we, we have to look at our unmarked cruisers as well. And so if we hold off on mark cruisers, that just delays our whole replacement plan and racks up mileage on others. Okay. Yep. Okay. Uh, Michael. Hello. Uh, uh, first and foremost, thank you, chief. Um, thank you for the cuts that you were willing to make. And, uh, obviously you're feeling some pain. Um, has there been any any reallocation of school resource officers to help you get this through since they're not in school? I guess that would be my first question. Uh, the deputy and I talked about that and I'm going to deflect that one to him. I think he's uh, had conversation and done some research on that. Yeah, so uh, school has been in session this year. They started September 14th or 15th. Um, so both resource officers uh, were in school this this year. Um, high school was a little bit remote, uh, but they were in school starting at 10 a.m. Elementary was in school uh, full time. Um, last year, when the pandemic hit, um, we had a few options. We always encourage our school resource officers to try to take their vacation time if they're willing. Um, obviously, a non-school hours, which they are always willing to do that so they can be in school. So they took a lot of their um, time and uh, as well as um, they are always, uh, they always know and we have used them on the road to cover day shift as well. So yes, Michael, they are, they are available uh, for, the, for that reason to help us out on the shift as well. Thank you for that, Kevin. The, um, uh, and I would I just ask that at some point, Larry, we as a board bring back this, and I don't know all the pros and cons, but whether or not we need a resource, school resource officer in each school, if, if that's contractual or if that's just something the town voted before. But uh, as you need more people on the road and we're unable to fill the two vacant positions, uh, I'd like to at least have the conversation if it, if it uh, the benefit if the benefit is there to having a, a school resource officer in each school. Um, secondly, the the uh, the cruiser that is now marked K9. Um, I know, Chief, you and I have had conversation about this in the past. Is that fully funded by the school and donations, or is any part of your budget covering the new K9 position that that, that the town never voted? No, that's fully funded by the donation account, Michael. Um, uh, Officer Clark has a cruiser assigned to him. Obviously, that's in our budget. He would have that whether he had the canine or not. But I, I think the, uh, you know, the markup and the cage and everything else was was handled through donation. Okay, and a follow up to that um, on collective bargaining when this comes back up, um, is there going to be a change in in the canine officer's pay due to the additional responsibility? <laughs> no. No. Okay. All right. Now, just re reading special assignments and whatnot, and whether or not there's a stipend for it or anything else, and I, I just hope that that's a conversation that we have before we um, automatically increase anything. Because again, I, I think it's I think it's a good thing. I have not heard from uh, the school or from from Tommy on whether or not it's working, um, but certainly being done on a donation level and, and uh, but school budget, as I relate to you, chief and town budget, um, that should be something that's discussed, not just something that doesn't just happen. Um, I know the cruisers, Kevin, are, are, are um, based on mileage is how you guys try and do this. You roll them over and then the cars are offered to other departments or trade. And are we okay? with uh, the guys that are out there and, and, and girls that are out there in these cruisers? Are the, is the mileage, or are we really sacrificing something by not replacing a cruiser this year? No, we are not. And um, I, I have been in contact with the patrol level. Um, we, we and, I, and I said this last year too, and I wanna say it again with Kyle at Highway and his maintenance staff in the DPW. Um, we have over the past year since I've been here, have really been able to safely, and that is the key word here, safely get these vehicles 
um, to about 120. And in years past, especially with Crown Vicks, uh, if we hit 100,000, we were not safe. So the way these vehicles are built now, um, we are safely and comfortably getting to 120,000. Um, and, and that's pretty much the cutoff, Mike, on, on those miles. Uh, thank you, Kevin. And again, I just say great job, Chief. Uh, Kevin, and then please give a, a thanks to, to your entire team, from me at least. We will. Thanks, Michael. You might. Michael, uh, uh, Don? Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, especially off the, the prior comments, I want to point out that we're talking about a budget forward-looking and that uh, the goal of COVID-19 is to more fully open all the schools uh, so that there'll be full sessions. Uh, I, I think this is kind of a false equivalency right now to compare this year to any year. Uh, additionally, when I go back, to the reason that these things started uh, in the early 2000s, uh, late 1990s, actually, uh, including Sheila House and there was a youth chaplain and creating the resource officers, uh, it were not only a spate of attempted suicides, but there were... Uh, a lot of the encounters with uh, both substance abuse and uh, females that were actually on a list that were targeted by uh, young males uh, for untoward activities. And I, before I would be willing to even think about uh, dropping the resource officers, I thought it was one of our success stories. I'd like to see where we came from and where we are uh, because it's a lot harder. Uh, and I know the chief and the deputy would agree with this. It's a lot harder dealing with that problem when somebody's in their thirties or forties than it is dealing with it when they're 15, 16, 17, and they have an opportunity to be turned around, uh, you know, through what, whatever means. I never looked at this as a major police presence as much as another form of mentoring. And at one point in time, I can tell you for a fact with my own kids and the foster children I've had through the school, they looked at the police as the real solid contact points, even more so than the guidance counselors or the teachers in the school. They were really had developed a solid relationship with the teams uh, in the community and never hate to lose that. Thank you, Don. Uh, John, I'll turn it over to you then. Thank you, Larry. Uh, and thank you, Chief and, and Deputy Chief for your presentation. Uh, Mary? I have no questions, just uh, thank you, Chief, Deputy Chief, and, and your staff for what you've done through a, a crazy year. So thank you very much. Uh, Dale? Um, thank you, John. Uh, good morning, Chief. Thank you for your presentation. Um, I just have one question. Can you tell me what roles will be going unfunded yeah, the two the two vacant positions um, through no fault of our own. We we came very close to being able to fill one of them, but we had a resignation this past October after he had completed the academy and was in field training. So um, the the you know there the positions initially we you know since I've been chief in 2015, um, those two positions have been added within the past uh, six years, and they were added. Um, by all rights as an enhancement of services. Um, so th th those um, vacancies that are not being funded, and this is what, this is kind of like the, uh, finessing it a bit. I'm asking that they not be eliminated, but they be unfunded for this particular year. This is a more of a, as you, I would refer to it as a tactical decision in response to a situation we find ourselves in where we have to come up with a large chunk of money out of the budget that is 89% salaries and wages. So um, I certainly hope moving forward, if we come out of COVID, if things look a little better, that I would be able to fund those positions again. But um, the, the stark reality of it, when I say the tactical decision is, it's uh, if you were to authorize me to fill those positions right now, and we started, um, the impact of those two uh, positions are not realized until FY23. It takes a full year to select, train, and um, field uh, a fully trained officer. So um, it's not really positions uh, that, that are impacting our ability to provide police services right now. It's going to impact our ability in FY23 
uh, to provide enhanced services or react to a, a major staffing situation like with phase before, which is potentially down six officers. Wow. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, I have no Angelo? Uh, thank you, John. It, it, it strikes me that having those two police officers would be a good thing uh, and something that would be wonderful if we can figure out how to generate the dollars. So I, I guess I asked the question before finalizing that, are there things that are in the budget in other areas that can be reduced? Uh, I, I don't want to go through things I think might want to be reduced, but I think the selectmen and the, and the group should take a look at seeing if we can come up with, what, what roughly $200,000? and then make this decision. And that's just my view. Thank, thank you, Ray. Uh, uh, Ann? Ann? Uh, John, I don't, uh, I don't have any questions, but I just want to say to the chief, thanks, uh, thanks for doing such a great job during these uh, very difficult times. <clears throat> thank you. Thank you, Mark. Ms. Mayor, the school resource officers do a great job of working with the kids, but no questions. Thank you, Mark. Uh, thank you, Chief and, and Deputy Chief, uh, uh, for your presentation. Just a couple quick questions, uh, Chief, and obviously what everybody said during these pandemics, it must be very stressful for everybody involved. I mean, uh, you're dealing with a you know an infectious pandemic, your police officer on the front line, and, uh, and then you have people out there that you're dealing with. So thank you for that. Uh, just a quick question to follow up on the resource officer uh, thing with uh, with uh, Michael brought up, and it, when he brought it up, it just dawned on me that the officer that we have in the uh, in the high school is 25% of his costs uh, covered by Chatham through the through the school budget, or or do we pay the full price for him? No, that's that's covered completely within the police department budget. Okay, that's that's uh. Good, good point to remember. Uh, thank you. Uh, radios, I know you uh, are going in the joint venture with the fire department uh, for radios, uh, and that's a, a, both departments of public safety are completely outfitting all your new radios, right? Yes, and uh, kudos to, to uh, Chief LeBlanc for uh, uh, putting that on his plate and helping us out with that. And a tremendous thanks to Deputy Chief Considine. He's been working uh, hand in glove with uh, Chief LeBlanc, and uh, I think we have it well in hand. We should be able to, uh, you know, with this working with the state grant that's available, um, save a significant amount of money uh, that we were anticipating having to put out on capital. So. That includes both. Uh, I know you have a lot more vehicles in the fire department. Does that cover vehicles and, and handhelds, if you want to call them that? Yes, it does. Everything. The only the only sticking point that the deputy and I uh, talked about is that they're they're being kind of stingy with allowing us any spares. But it it does cover all active radios in use, so mobiles and portables. Yes. Okay. Thank you. And I, I think you have a fingerprint machine somewhere in there for capital. A new fingerprint yes. machine. Yes, that's out on, uh, that's for FY22 Capital. It's been there. That's a regular replacement yeah. of that machine. It's rather expensive. Uh, it's the machine that everybody gets fingerprint on. It's electronically, you know, it scans electronically the fingerprints and it allows us the capability to identify somebody within minutes. Um, so it's the rather critical piece of, of equipment for our for our station. And it's uh, requires some, uh, you know, it's getting old. It requires some upgrades. In the in the technology, and if we were to let it go, uh, it would uh, it would not be a good uh, good thing. So uh, that's why I was out on the capital plan. Yep, uh, thank you. And then uh, the, the last question uh, on the vehicle thing. You mentioned uh, 125,000 miles is a good thing, but these crews are actually sitting running a lot, and so I I would contribute. You know that 125; those are actual miles. But you know you run these engines all the time, and so you, I don't know what the equivalent is in mileage, but uh, they're pretty worn out, I imagine. It's true. Uh, so by the time you get to 100, 125, it's a tired car. It's not like the family minivan. Um, a lot of the driving is is uh, can be high speed. A lot of braking, like you said, a lot of idle time. 
uh, and that's necessary to keep the emergency lights going at a scene and also to keep our MDTs, the in-car in, in computer, uh, online so uh, checks and things of that nature can be accomplished. So uh, it is, yes, by, by that mileage, it's a tired vehicle that it definitely needs to be replaced. One last question that maybe Joe could just maybe he can answer it better is uh, when it does get used and, and turned over, we used to turn them into other town departments. I don't know if that practice still goes on. Uh, and either you or Joe can address that. So. Uh, Chief, if I may, I'll, I'll address that because yes, it's it would be considered surplus property. In other words, when the police department uh, no longer has a use for, for that particular property, uh, the chief would alert me, I would alert the board, and, and we would offer it to other departments, which is required under the procurement laws for the disposition of surplus property. Uh, if no other departments have a use for it, or if there's a greater use uh, and, and disposing of it by trade-in, we would uh, avail ourselves of that. But um, that process still remains because it's a procurement process. Thank you, Joe. And that concludes my questions, Larry. Thank you, John. Uh, Joe, let me ask you for concluding remarks on this, and then uh, we'll pause and let you conclude the entire meeting. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. First, to the to the discussion about the school resource <laughs> officers, I didn't want it to go too far afield. Uh, while it is true that uh, Officer Clark at uh, Montemoy Regional High School uh, is um, through the Harwich Police Department, I think it's equally true that uh, Chatham Sergeant Massey at the middle school uh, is, is borne by Chatham. And so the town's have split the cost between the middle school and the high, excuse me, have taken their cost for high school and middle school, and each town has its own uh, resource officer in the elementary schools. So I believe that that fact is correct. Uh, and then if I could just could, as, as Chief Gilmet uh, said at the, the outset, and if you would bear with me for a moment again, um, you know, the magnitude of the anniversary that uh, we recognize today, if you will, um, very early on, uh, Chief Clark, uh, our fire chief at the time, Chief Gilmet, uh, Deputy Chief Considine, and, and Deputy Chief LeBlanc at the time, uh, were very willing and gracious hosts uh, to the health director and I uh, while we were ensconced in the emergency operations center in the earliest days of the pandemic. And one of my earliest memories is just hearing uh, Chief and Deputy Chief discuss uh, something that I think for me as a civilian and maybe others just would have considered to be a deny, uh, excuse me, a benign conversation at the time took on a whole uh, new meaning and new level. And that was uh, the very early discussions that they had to have regarding uh, something as routine as traffic stops. And if you think about that for a moment, what a traffic stop meant in the early days of the pandemic, we, we truly didn't know what that was gonna um, do to our officers. And so something as routine and simple as that took on a whole greater meaning and that's what really in, informed and, and took up our time in the earliest days of the pandemic. Uh, and, and I use that to just then echo what everyone has said, uh, Chief Gilmet to you and Deputy Chief Considine, uh, to you and through you on behalf of your entire department, the men and women of our police force, um, all that they do, but certainly all that they accomplished. And uh, what was an incredibly challenging year, I would imagine, for our men and women that wear the shield not just because of the pandemic, but because of all the social uh, aspects and, and social um, discourse that was out there last year. It is an exceedingly difficult job. I know that firsthand from family members, uh, and it was made exceedingly more difficult last year, and it remains so. So I do think it's appropriate for us to end our discussion on police to just offer those thanks uh, to you, Chief, to you, Deputy Chief, and through you to, your, uh, to the men and women uh, of your police force. Thank you. Uh, Ed, did you have a comment? Yeah, well, yeah, it, it was actually a, a question as um, Joe was uh, pointing out that Chatham covers the costs of the uh, uh, school resource officers who serve in, in the schools in Chatham. I know in the past uh, with Cape Cod Tech, um, uh, originally we provided that uh, officer and then along the way, we uh, uh, made the request of Cape Cod Tech and, and they started picking up a portion of the cost. Is that still happening? Yes, uh, Depp, I believe it's, it's $20,000 is covered by Tech. 
That's correct. Of his okay. salary. Thank you. Larry? Uh, yes, Don? Yeah, yeah before, before we go to Joe's uh, overall summary, uh, I'm gonna riff on what uh, Ed was asking. Um, with the resource officers, John, uh, just wanted to bring this up to you. If we were to get uh, the, the towns to get uh, uh, relieved of the obligation of the, uh, the officers by uh, the schools budgeting them, we'd wind up paying 75% for both officers uh, in that formula. And second of all, uh, schools enjoy an immense amount of latitude. If we, if we ask them to bring it into their budget, they can shift uh, money around within their budget with, with impunity. We don't get to do that on the, you know, the governmental side. Uh, when something is appropriated uh, to a particular line item, that's, that's where it goes. Uh, so in terms of the actual absolute control over uh, that asset and, and how it gets deployed and what you want to do with it and what the cost controls would be, this is the model you want to follow. Otherwise, we're either going to pay more or we're going to wind up losing uh, control uh, of the money. Uh, I, I've never seen anybody take a, a, a wash through on money without taking some sort of a cut somewhere, John. Let me put it to you that way. It'd be best to put where where the actual pay uh, is uh, debited, and that's at the police department level. Don, um, uh, Carol, uh, remarks on the police budget? I think that the police department is the, the most significant department that had to make reductions in their budget. Um, and I would applaud the board if you would consider, you know, um, a way to fund that department fully. Thank you, Carol. Uh, Joel, you want to uh, summary, summarize our uh, day? Certainly, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you to you, the members of the Board of Selectmen, uh, to Chairman Troy and the members of the Finance Committee. So this will conclude our third of four budget hearings. And just a reminder, uh, Monday evening, March 15th, uh, sometime after 6.30, uh, this group will conclude the fourth uh, set of departmental budget presentations, and we will conclude with the finance division, which is assessing accounting and tax, information technology, library, and ending with our town engineer and the engineering department. And uh, thank you all again for your efforts. Um, again, a year ago, we could have dispatched this in a day, but I think this has been a, a very um, useful and robust robust. Uh, exercise and that's because of all of you and your commitment to the process so uh, personally speaking thank you for that uh, thank you Joe uh, John uh, do you wish to uh, disband the uh, FinCom not sure I, I'll do that just uh, just uh, just a quick comment uh, I just re to remind my board of Monday night's meeting Joe just did uh, is uh is if concludes the department of heads meeting but then going into the selections meeting there's some important important items too uh there that you can look at their packet i'll send out a note uh, tomorrow outlining those and to remind folks that we have a public hearing on tuesday night on the budget that uh, joe will be presenting after joe finishes the presentation and the public hearing is closed uh, we will go into the warrant articles so please uh, read up on the art Warren articles so we can start voting on those. And then we have another meeting Thursday night. <laughs> so thank you all for participation. I didn't obtain a motion to adjourn the meeting. So moved. Mark, and seconded. Second. Anybody want to second, great hearing and no discussion. Uh, all those in favor, Mary? Aye. Dale? Aye. Uh, Angelo? Aye. Aye. Uh, Dan? Aye. Mark? Aye. And I'm an aye. Thank you all. Thank you, Larry, for, and Joe and Carol. Thank you. I entertain a motion Thank to adjourn the public selectman. Ed? Yeah, I'd make the, that motion to uh, adjourn uh, our meeting, but uh, I'm glad that the Finance Committee voted to adjourn uh, their committee rather than disbanding their committee. <laughs> <laughs> Which I thought I would give them. I thought I'd give them that opportunity. Is there a second? <laughs> and just want to remind everybody, it, it keeps on popping up on my screen. We have daylight savings time. 
rollback tonight yeah. or spring yeah. forward or whatever it is. So so is there there second there? Chairs, second chairs motion? I did second it. Okay. Thank you, Don. I'll take roll call. Don? Aye. Michael? He says aye. Yep. Ed? Aye. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and I'm, I will. Uh, thanks again, everyone, for uh, attending this Saturday morning meeting, and we'll uh, see you in a couple days. Have a good day. Thank you.